Hi, and thanks for joining the Talking Animals Law and Philosophy series. Uh, I'm Raphael Fazel. I'm the co-director of the Cambridge Center for Animal Rights Law, and it's great to have uh, all of you here uh, with us today. Uh, some of you may be joining for the first time, so this is usually where I say a few words about how the Talking Animals series works. Um, after my short introduction, uh, we will uh, have a presentation by our speaker that will last somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes. And then we'll segue into a uh, discussion and Q&A part of this event. Uh, the, the first part, the talk itself will be recorded, but the discussion won't be recorded. So everyone's invited to join in in the discussion. If you have any questions for our speaker, if you have any comments to make, um, you're warmly invited to do so. In fact, I would encourage you to do so directly by just raising your hand using the reactions button in your Zoom app, and then you can ask your question directly to Sarin. It makes for a much nicer discussion, mm -hmm. usually, um, than me reading through, uh, you know, uh, the comments in the chat. But equally, understand that you know it may not be possible for some of you to actually turn on your mics and camera. So if you prefer to put something in the chat, that's absolutely fine too. The event itself will end at 6.30 p.m. UK time. And I'll have all the microphones on mute until we reach the discussion bit of this event. Okay, that's as far as uh, the sort of the housekeeping of this event is concerned. And it is now my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. And that's Sarin uh, Ratledge Pryor. Sarin is a research fellow with the Australian National University's Crawford School of Public Policy. Her work focuses on how animals can be better represented in the political legal sphere. And she looks at how liberal democracies should accommodate those who advocate for animals too. Uh, Sarin, as some of you may know, is currently a visiting researcher with us here at the Cambridge Center for Animal Rights Law. And during her time in Cambridge, she is exploring the moral frameworks that underpin animal welfare law and policy. And she looks at how these frameworks can be broadened, can be extended to better recognize the agency, dignity, and relationality of animals rather than just looking at the sentience. And Sarin's presentation today is entitled Expanding the Ethical Foundations of Animal Law and Policy. Please join me in welcoming Sarin to the series. Sarin, over to you. Um, thank you so much, Raphael. Uh, I'll just share my screen uh, and then we'll get started. All right. Is that looking good for everyone? Looks great. Great. Okay. Um, so... I probably should have uh, given Raphael the kind of updated uh, title of my talk, but here it is anyway. Um, it is still very much on the same kind of idea of, you know, what is underpinning um, animal rights, um, what is underpinning animal law, but I'm kind of focusing in on this idea of the rights of nature. Um, so still, you're, you're hopefully going to be getting what, what you came for um, uh, with, the, with the talk. All right, uh, so without further ado, let's get started. Uh, okay, so last year, uh, the UK luxury fashion brand House of Hackney appointed Mother Nature uh, to its board of directors um, following the appointment of Nature to the board of fellow UK company Faith in Nature. Um, so the idea that nature should have its own rights um, has seemingly well and truly come. Um, rather than looking at how Mother Nature might contribute to corporate bottom lines, though, it's the goal of this paper um, to consider how they might contribute to animals' struggle for rights. Okay, so while, um, as, as many of you are probably aware, the non-human rights projects campaigns have garnered a lot of publicity for the proposal to extend rights to at least certain animals, through having them recognized as legal persons, um, this isn't the only game in town. There has also been a recent flurry of popular and scholarly discussion about the rights of nature as a means of extending legal rights beyond the human. Indeed, there have been an increasing number of communities, towns, states, and international bodies around the world campaigning for 
and in many cases actually achieving formal legal recognition for um, nature as, as intrinsically valuable with rights to exist and flourish. Now, this body of law is still in its infancy, so it's not always very clear how these provisions will be able, will be used to protect animals, or if indeed they can be used at all. Um, perhaps they're just kind of symbolic statements. Nevertheless, there are signs that the rights of nature can be effective and not merely just kind of symbols of, of community values. So perhaps the most significant example of this is the case of Estreita, uh, a woolly monkey from Colombia, um, which some of you may have heard of. Um, all right, so the rights of nature movement therefore represents an important alternative to legal personhood as a means through which animals can gain greater protection by the legal system. By contrast with the cases brought in the United States by the Non-Human Rights Project, the Animal Legal Defense Fund and PETA, the discussion in the courts does not center around the issue of what a legal or metaph metaphysical person is and whether animals can or should be recognized as having that status. Instead, since these animals are recognized as being a part of nature, the rights of nature are quite simply and straightforwardly just taken to encompass them. Therefore, if we're interested in the question of how animals can be better protected by the legal system, it's important to consider the rights of nature as an alternative kind of legal entryway for animals to that of the personhood paradigm. Beyond its promise in expanding the scope of rights holding to animals, the movement has also been held up as an important opportunity for Indigenous thought to be able to gain power in the mainstream. Many have pointed out how the rights of nature have emerged, um, at least in part, from Indigenous intellectual thought, and others have noted that ind Indigenous political representatives have been central to the passing of rights of nature provisions. Um, while there has been much positive press for the rights of nature, this movement has not been entirely without its critics. There are those who have questioned whether rights of nature provisions actually have much power to make change given competing land development interests. Critics have also pointed out how the apparent adoption of Indigenous concepts into a Western legal setting might divest these concepts of their original power to affect change for Indigenous communities. Beyond these criticisms, however, there hasn't really been much critical attention paid to the movement as a foundation for the rights of animals. Instead, um, I think many animal rights um, and law scholars have been somewhat positive about the movement as an encouraging way forward for animals. And it's not hard to see why, when the experience of high profile animal advocacy groups in the US, such as the Non-Human Rights Project, um, in trying to achieve rights and standing for animals has been so fraught with struggle and for so little kind of practical reward. Nevertheless, while we might celebrate the achievements made by animal plaintiffs like Estreita, who is from Ecuador, I think I said Colombia early and earlier and then immediately realized my mistake. So Estreita from Ecuador. Um, and, you know, we might be hopeful about what this might mean for other animals. We should be willing to critically address whether the rights of animals are ultimately best established through the rights of nature. So this paper addresses that critical gap um, by exploring whether the rights of nature concept might succeed as a viable and desirable alternative to the personhood paradigm. So just a little bit of context, um, this paper is actually a um, new chapter that I've been working on to add to my upcoming book, where I'm going to be exploring the basis of, um, uh, I, I guess, exploring how animals are included in the legal system and on what basis this happens. Um, and where I'll be proposing my own account of how we can better include um, non-human entities like animals and even the environment. Um, so I am a bit dismissive of legal personhood, uh, but my reasons for this are explained in a previous section of the book. Um, so I'm not going to go into that in too much detail here. Um, and I'm also not going to be outlining what my proposed alternative is, um, but stay tuned. If this is of interest to you, uh, you will be able to read all about it in the not too distant future. All right, so as to the outline of the rest of the talk, um, the paper proceeds via an overview of rights of nature legal developments around the world. Um, I then explore how these developments have been used to support the cases of a number of animal plaintiffs. 
Um, we'll then look at critiques of the rights of nature movement. So I'll be developing the ideas of those like Menea Tanisescu and others in relation to the potential of the rights of nature to achieve real, real change for Indigenous groups um, by linking this critique to the treatment of animals. I'll then offer two further critiques uh, that the rights of nature provisions fail to challenge the human slash all other nature divide and that rights of nature represent, as I define it, a kind of eco-coverture. All right, so before proceeding any further, a bit of a clarification, what exactly do I mean by the rights of nature? So for the purposes of this paper, um, I'm concerned with instances in which rights have been granted to animals with reference to the rights of nature as established in legal provisions, such as a constitution or legislation. So when I'm speaking of the rights of nature, I'm referring to instances where nature or the environment um, as kind of an umbrella entity has been recognized as a legal entity um, with legal standing and or particular substantive rights. Um, so it's here that animals derive or have the potential to derive substantive rights um, and the standing to uh, assert those rights through their being a part of nature. As such, while instances of particular non-human individuals or species gaining legal protection, um, I'm thinking here, for example, of the recent uh, Panama uh, legislation that grants sea turtles the right to a healthy environment, for example, while these might commonly be kind of regarded as instances of the rights of nature, um, they're not included for the purposes of this paper. Um, as I see it, that's just an example, a pretty straightforward example of animal rights rather than the rights of nature. Um, so I'm also not specifically interested, um, again, for the purposes of this paper, with examples of where particular natural entities, such as rivers or lakes, have been granted legal personhood or rights. Um, this is because, as far as I'm aware, there haven't yet been any instances of animals deriving rights from the rights of these entities. Um, but it is early days, um, and should such a thing happen, um, then I think the, the critique that I'm making here, you know, could also be extended to these cases as well. Okay, so um, since the rights of nature were first explicitly recognized in a national constitution in 2008, rights of nature jurisprudence has proliferated around the world. Legal provisions that recognize the rights of nature are now to be found in each of the world's inhabited continents. Recognition of the rights of nature can be found in international documents, constitutions, indigenous and tribal law, legislation, case law, declarations, policies, and community ordinances. While efforts to formally recognize the rights of nature have not always succeeded, um, and while recognition hasn't always resulted in practical benefits, at least not yet, um, in many cases, such efforts have succeeded and, and have borne real fruit. Um, and as we can see from this map, this is kind of a, a bit of a snapshot of, of countries and, and regions around the world where um, rights of nature of some form of another, some form or another have been recognized. Um, so next, I'm going to outline a range of examples as, of successful attempts to have the rights of nature instilled in legal provisions. Um, and then we'll explore how these provisions have been applied to a number of animals in the courts. Okay, so first up, we have Ecuador. So Ecuador was the first country in the world to recognize the rights of nature after a successful referendum in 2008 saw the introduction of a new constitution. Um, the constitutional referendum came in the wake of decades of political instability and was initiated by the newly elected president, Rafael Correa, who ran in the 2006 elections on a platform of greater citizen empowerment. Now, the 2008 constitution is underpinned by the principle, um, the indigenous principle of sumac corse, or in Spanish, buen vivir, which is one of the key um, Ecuadorian proponents of the constitution would explain. Um, it encompasses recognition of conceptions of sustainability and respect for nature that are promoted by indigenous societies. Articles 71 and 72 of the Ecuadorian constitution state, respectively, that nature, or Pachamama, another indigenous term, has the right to integral respect for its existence and for the maintenance and regeneration of its life cycles, structures, functions, and evolutionary processes, and that it has the right to be restored. 
since 2008, the rights of nature have been invoked um, by the Ecuadorian courts in a number of cases to protect natural entities. Um, so the rights of nature uh, provisions, constitutional provisions, were first put to the test in the 2011 case of the Vilcabamba River. After the river was impacted by a nearby development project, two locals sued on behalf of the river, invoking this constitutionally enshrined right of nature. The court sided on behalf of the river and ordered the municipal government to undertake its rehabilitation. Um, so in general, efforts to enforce the rights of nature in Ecuador have been largely successful. Um, with one recent review indicating that 10 of the 13 cases seeking to enforce rights of nature in Ecuador have in fact been upheld by the courts. Um, a number of other South and Central American countries have since followed Ecuador's lead and have introduced, um, and in some cases passed, legislation that provides rights to nature. Uh, while Bolivia's 2009 constitution doesn't explicitly recognize the rights of nature, it does recognize that um, non-human living things have the capacity to exercise a right to a healthy, protected and balanced environment. Um, and in 2010, Bolivia also passed uh, legislation recognizing the rights of La Madre Tierra, um, Mother Nature. Um, and in 2012, um, they passed a law providing a framework for balancing the rights of Mother Nature alongside the people's rights to development required for this notion of living well or vivir bien. The Bolivian government is also currently considering a bill um, which was submitted in 2021 that would prevent ecocide, um, which is defined as a serious damage to biodiversity, ecosystem and the rights of mother nature. In 2022, Panama passed legislation that outlines the rights of nature alongside the duties of the state in relation to those rights. Um, and these rights were upheld in 2023, with the Supreme Court ruling that the contract of the country's largest copper mine was unconstitutional, with the ruling drawing explicitly on the 2022 Rights of Nature law. Um, in the United States, the rights of nature have also um, uh, proliferated, though at more of the local level than at state or national levels. So a number of towns, cities and counties, and I've kind of indicated where these are on the map, um, have passed uh, local community ordinances that recognize and align the rights of nature. Um, and also there are a lot of instances where uh, the rights of particular water bodies, um, like lakes, for example, have also been recognized. Um, Native American nations have also been at the forefront of rights of nature recognition. Um, so the Navajo Nation's Code of 2002 recognizes that all creation from Mother Earth and Father Sky to the animals, those who live in the water, those who fly and plant life have their own laws and rights and freedoms to exist. In 2018, the Ho-Chunk Nation voted to amend its constitution to state that ecosystems, natural communities and species within the Ho-Chunk Nation territory possess inherent fundamental and inalienable rights to naturally exist, flourish, regenerate and evolve. Outside the Americas, um, in 2019, Uganda became the first and to date only um, African country to formally recognize the rights of nature. Um, so this East African nation passed legislation that asserts that the right, uh, that nature has the right to exist, persist, maintain and regenerate its vital cycles, structure, function, and its processes in evolution. Um, and as you can see, I'm a bit of a bird fan and I was delighted to see these different birds that are included on flags like that of Uganda um, and Ecuador and I had to had to look them up. So I thought I would share them with you. Um, so we've got Euro uh, India as well is, is next up. Um, and so while India doesn't explicitly refer to the rights of nature, the Indian constitution does list as one of the fundamental duties of citizens um, protecting and improving the natural environment, including forests, lakes, rivers, and wildlife. Um, and the rights of nature have been recognized a little bit more explicitly through the Indian courts. Um, so for example, in the South Indian state of Tamil Nadu, the Madras High Court declared that it is the right time to declare slash conferred juristic status to mother nature um, and made the following statement, which I've put up um, on the screen. Um, I think the translation wasn't as great as it as it could have been, but you you get the gist. 
Um, and just finally, um, Europe um, is perhaps a little bit uh, behind the ball, but several countries have at least introduced proposals to recognise the rights of nature. Um, and this includes Ireland, Germany, um, Sweden and, and Switzerland. Um, so things are starting to move there. Now, as suggested earlier, certain of these rights of nature provisions have had practical implications in the courts, with natural entities having had their rights asserted and upheld. But there have also been instances in which individual animals and animal groups have successfully um, had their rights asserted under rights of nature provisions. Um, and now we're going to turn to discuss some of those. Uh, so first up, a, a couple of kind of anti-examples. Um, so as mentioned, Ecuador is the first country to explicitly recognize the rights of nature in its constitution, but Argentina was first to formally recognize an animal as the subject of legal rights, um, in the context of habeas corpus law anyway. Now, while a number of cases in Argentina involving animal plaintiffs have been uh, discussed in the context of rights of nature, I don't take these to be kind of true examples of the rights of nature um, as a grounding for animal rights um, for reasons that I've already touched on earlier in the talk. Um, so this is because Argentina doesn't recognize the rights of nature in its in its constitution or in legislation. Um, so how then did animals like Cecilia, Sandra and Lola Limon um, gain recognition as subjects of rights? And I would recommend you look up their cases because they are quite interesting. Um, but the answer to this um, lies in the constitutional right of Argentinians, human Argentinians, that is, to a healthy environment. So in each of these three cases, the courts refer to Section 41 of the Argentinian Constitution, which states that all inhabitants enjoy the right to a healthful, balanced environment, and that environmental damage shall generate as a priority the obligation to repair it. As such, we don't have rights bestowed on animals by virtue of their being a part of nature, but rather we have kind of incidental protections afforded animals on the basis that humans have the right to a healthy environment. Um, so by contrast, with the case of Estrellita, um, again, a woolly monkey from Ecuador. Um, so this does, I think, represent an instance of the rights of nature as, as a grounding for animal rights. Um, Though again, I'm not going to go into Esther Yida's case here because it has been discussed relatively widely. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, I'm happy to discuss it in, in question time if you like. Um, but instead, I'm just going to touch on a couple of other less well-publicized cases which also draw on the rights of nature to affirm animal rights. Um, so first up, uh, in 2014, the Indian Supreme Court case um, Animal Welfare Board of India versus, versus Nagaraja um, address the issue of the traditional practice of Jalikatu, which is kind of bull taming, kind of like a rodeo sort of traditional event. Um, and in affirming the rights of the bulls in this case, the justices drew on India's animal welfare law, but also referred several times to Section 51 AG of India's constitution which states that citizens have a duty to protect the environment. So here it says that Parliament, um, the court says, um, Parliament, by incorporating this article, has again reiterated and re-emphasised the fundamental duties on human beings toward every living creature, which evidently takes in bulls as well. Um, so the rights of bulls in this case, therefore, can kind of be seen at least partially as deriving from the environment's constitutional right to protection. Next up, um, we have uh, a condor from Ecuador. Um, so this condor, uh, whose name was uh, Philippe, um, had previously been rescued and rehabilitated by the Ecuadorian Minister, Ministry of the Environment um, and was later found uh, dead with several bullet wounds. Um, so the man who had shot Philippe um, had posted photos of himself on social media with Philippe's body. Um, and through these photos, he was able to be tracked down and he was arrested. Um, in court, the judge referred to how the man had infringed upon the rights of nature by threatening the existence of condors, which are an endangered species. Um, the man was convicted of the crime and sentenced to six months in prison. Um, probably cold comfort for Philippe, uh, but, you know, it's, it's something. Um, and my final example 
um, also comes from Ecuador, uh, where in 2011, a fleet of several fishing vessels was found in the Galapagos Marine Reserve. Um, the boats were searched and inside um, they discovered 357 shark corpses. Um, a criminal lawsuit was brought against the captain and several of the crew members on the basis that shark fishing is illegal in this reserve and additionally that the rights of nature were being violated. Um, after four years of litigation, uh, the defendants were found guilty of the charges with the captain given two years imprisonment and the crew members one year each. Now, these cases um, show how the rights of nature have successfully been used in support of extending rights to certain non-human animals. They might not be the only basis um, of these rights, um, but they are used as, as a justification. Before we conclude that the rights of nature are the best solution to animals, you know, kind of lack of legal rights and lack of legal standing, however, we should con uh, consider the potential downsides of this approach. Um, and this is what we'll be doing in the remainder of the talk. All right, so certain scholars, um, as, as touched on earlier, have cautioned proponents of the rights of nature to be a little bit more critical of assumed linkages between indigenous worldviews with the rights of nature. Um, Manea Tanisescu, for example, cautions that, quote, in identifying Indigenous philosophies with rights of nature too closely, we run the risk of diminishing the radical potential of alternative political arrangements. That is, while acknowledging that Indigenous people have, in fact, often been at the forefront of rights of nature advocacy, we need to be a little bit more critical of the notion that the rights of nature necessarily serve an emancipatory purpose for either Indigenous peoples or the natural world, at least as they have been implemented in practice. Tanisescu notes that in applying the concept of legal personhood uh, to nature, um, that this risks mis mixing moral and legal notions in ways that are ultimately unhelpful because the idea of the person is always already modelled on a particular kind of being. Indeed, this tends to be a being that is highly rational, fully responsible, um, and strikingly human-shaped. Similarly, in her analysis of Bolivia's adoption of um, rights of nature laws, Agnesi Bellina suggests that the process in which these laws were adopted can be read as a deliberate and gradual weakening of Indigenous plural political claims in favour of the state's monopoly of power over and the foreclosure of such claims. Belina charts how the work of the Unity Pact, an umbrella organization representing indigenous um, and uh, peasant farmer groups in establishing principles of land protection through autonomous indigenous governance was appropriated and watered down by Evo Morales and his Movimiento al Socialismo party. Belina notes by way of example that the Unity Pact's draft law of Mother Earth which was presented to the Brazilian Environmental Commission in 2010, offers a radical challenge to Western ways of relating to the environment. Quote, Mother Earth as a subject of law demands a theoretical displacement and an ep epistemological break with modern Western juridical system, with the modern Western juridical system. It is about a different way of thinking. It is a matter of being open to juridical pluralism. Pluralism. The draft law not only suggested a break with Western legalities, but also with Western cultures and economics of modernity and predatory development. Yet, as Belina argues, the laws of the rights of Mother Nature, um, which drew on the Unity Pact's draft law, in fact obliterate any ref reference to epistemological and juridical pluralism, um, thus depriving alternative ways of being together of all meaning. Um, and indeed, Article 1 of this law explicitly frames the rights of Mother Nature as an element to be balanced alongside the goal of vivir bien, living well, and the development and investment that the wording of the law suggests are the means of achieving this goal. As scholar Eduardo Gudinas suggests, in conceptualizing vivir bien as the outcome of successful extractivist development, the Bolivian law minimizes vivir bien and robs it of its vocation as a radical break with development and the transcendence of modernity. To those observing Evo Morales's neo-extractivist policies, policies that would in fact see Bolivia reach record export highs in resources such as fossil fuels, metals, and soy, the idea that nature has attained meaningful rights is wrapped in contradictions. 
rights of nature provisions as conceptualized have therefore denied Indigenous communities opportunities to achieve radical change in relation to self-governance and to achieve a change in relationships with the land that are currently driven by the goals of extractivism. Yet the rights of nature go beyond um, this political wrangling for power. There is also the potential for epistemic harm in that it might encourage a shift away from Indigenous communities' traditional ways of knowing and relating to nature. Noting how the Ecuadorian constitution conflates the Indigenous figure of Pachamama with the Western notion of nature, Tanisescu reflects that rights of nature provisions can force the radical potential of, an indig of Indigenous cosmopolitics into the moulds of modernist ontology. Um, so drawing on these, these critiques, we should consider how this co-option and arguable watering down of Indigenous worldviews might impact on animals if rights of nature are to be their, their kind of, their, the foundation of their rights. So Indigenous peoples are the caretakers of significant proportions of the world's biodiversity. One United Nations report indicates that while Indigenous lands represent 20% of the Earth's territory, um, this land contains 80% of the world's biodiversity. Um, they're clearly um, pretty good at, at taking care of, of the land and the various beings and entities that live on that land. Now, of course, there may be tensions between Indigenous rights and animal rights, for example, as relating to the hunting of traditional animal food sources. However, there can be little disagreement, I think, that Indigenous practices in relation to animals and the environment, um, as underpinned by values of relationality um, and, and respect for non-human beings, are, I think, far more, far more ethical um, than many of those developed under Western industrialization and capitalism. I'm thinking of practices such as factory farming, invasive biomedical research, product testing, and so on. As such, if our goal is to achieve better protection for animals, we might think that the aim should be to move more towards Indigenous ways of existing alongside animals, rather than encouraging indig Indigenous systems to be co-opted um, and kind of subsumed by Western legal systems. Okay, so next up we have um, a critique concerning the traditional uh, Western divide between humans and all other nature. So first, let's consider what the sources of political and legal rights are. Inevitably, certain moral values are going to underpin how rights are formulated and how they are applied in practice. So what are the values that underpin human rights, for example? Um, the rights enumerated by the US Declaration of Independence, for example, um, are endowed to men by their quote unquote creator, uh, while the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights takes as its subjects all members of the human family. These and many other foundational legal documents have appealed to different religious and secular sources of value, including God's will and human dignity as the foundation of rights. Um, they have been mediated on paper and in practice by various political, moral, and biological considerations, including the nationality, religion, sex, and ethnicity of the rights holder. It is perhaps then a little too simplistic uh, to say that our rights at their core are grounded in the notion of mere humanity. Yet while one's humanity, certainly historically, has not been sufficient to ensure the holding or exercise of rights, um, I think humanity more than any other concept or category would seem to be a necessary element that underpins the ascription of rights um, in modern uh, legal systems. So in other words, rights are, unless explicitly stated otherwise, for humans. Might this kind of anthropocentrism be at risk from the rights of nature movement? Rights of na nature declarations and provisions, after all, are often supported by statements that stress their aim in decentering the human and in expanding the scope of moral and legal concern um, to, to beyond the human. Yet is this how rights of nature, at least as implemented in countries such as Ecuador and Bolivia, are understood? Um, are the jurisdictions that formally recognize the rights of nature committed to the idea that all of nature's entities, including humans, as merely one species among many, are equally worthy of rights on the basis of their being part of nature? The short answer would seem to be no. Rights of nature provisions have, 
as written and as applied, so far failed to establish the kind of flat political, a kind of ontological relationship between humans, other than human animals and the rest of the natural world that the rights of nature seem to promise. So consider that that pioneer text in the rights of nature's young history, the, the 2008 Ecuadorian constitution. While the concept of buen vivir is to be found in the preamble of Ecuador's uh, constitution, uh, the rights of nature themselves aren't to be outlined until Article 71. Uh, before then, there are a range of other articles that emphasize the importance of humans and their rights to use nature. Um, so, for example, in Article 1, it establishes that non-renewable natural resources found in Ecuadorian territory are the inalienable assets of the state. Um, and we also have that the rights, uh, the right of citizens to live in a healthy and ecologically balanced environment um, is established in Article 2, um, which, you know, this right to a healthy environment for humans comes well before the rights of nature themselves. Furthermore, um, Article 10, um, it has this kind of separation of the rights of persons, communities, peoples, nations, and uh, written communities again, anyway, uh, from the rights of nature. Um, so they're, they're kind of in two separate paragraphs there. Um, so this kind of suggests that the rights of humans are, are not built upon a foundation of the rights of nature, that these are kind of two separate categories. Um, so that while there is recognition, some recognition, that humans are reliant upon nature, there is no indication that human persons are constituted by or derive their inherent value from nature. Um, certainly not in the same way that animals arguably are when their rights are invoked by drawing on the rights of nature, in any case. Okay, and just in case we didn't get the message by Article 71, when the rights of nature are introduced, we are reminded in Article 74, that persons, communities, peoples and nations shall have the right to benefit from the environment and the natural wealth, enabling them to enjoy the good way of living. So taken together, this all seems to speak to the fact that the rights of humans to enjoy nature and to use it to maintain a good standard of life are the priority over the rights of nature herself. So I think what these examples um, suggest, um, and you can find similar things in, in the Bolivian laws, for example, um, what these suggest is that rights of nature provisions, while they do provide natural entities with you know, uh, access to legal protections that they might not have had access to before, don't really challenge this kind of divide between humans and all other nature that has always existed in Western law. Rather, they make it explicit now, this is, of course, I think, important for symbolic reasons um, in, in kind of maintaining this divide. Um, you know, humans are apart, set apart from all other nature. Um, but I think it also might have some practical implications um, in categorically separating the rights of nature and therefore the rights of animals, um, which might be de derived from nature, from the rights of humans this might be read as a kind of affirmation that the rights of humans deserve particular consideration. So consider rights to development um, and land use that are outlined in many of the constitutions and pieces of legislation that um, establish the rights of nature. Instead of seeing land use as a kind of element of human and other animals flourishing that is nevertheless constrained by the natural limits of ecosystems, land use and particularly development of the land becomes a kind of activity outside the constraints of nature and perhaps arguably in potential conflict with the interests of the nature. It becomes an activity that humans have a special right to. Okay, so my final critique um, is, is this idea of eco-coverture. So let me explain. Beyond the fact that in practice, human rights are grounded in, in the kind of characteristic of, of humanness um, to some extent, while animals' rights, at least under rights of nature, might be grounded in the characteris characteristic of naturalness, rights of nature frameworks fail to fully challenge the human all other nature divide in another, I think, more subtle way. Namely, in foregrounding the health and well-being of, of um animals, they would seem to privilege the rights of species and communities over those of individuals. Now, is legal individuality for animals even what we want? 
There are, of course, very important reasons to be critical of traditional notions of individuality and its role in political and legal subjecthood. And this is a point that many feminist legal scholars who promote relational approaches to legal autonomy have convincingly pointed out. Nevertheless, we should be concerned with an approach that arguably swings too far in the opposite direction, namely in the direction of recognizing the primacy of species over or entirely to the exclusion of the individual. My concern here is that rights of nature as a basis for animal rights might mean that animals as individuals are either not recognized altogether or de-emphasized relative to the rights of species or ecosystems. Rights of nature provisions outlined um, as above uh, tend to refer to species and ecosystems rather than individual animals. So the worry is that rights that don't pertain to ecosystem health um, and animals that are from species that aren't seen, to, uh, aren't seen to be contributing to healthy ecosystems as such may not be recognized. This is concerning because it fails to recognize the importance of animals as individuals who experience embodied harm as individuals, not merely as parts of a species or an ecological system. Um, so this, this brings me to this idea of eco-coverture as, as I define it. So in the common law tradition, um, a married woman was regarded as a femme covert, a covered woman with her legal identity under the system of coverture subsumed by that of her husband, um, who gained control of uh, his wife's property um, and essentially all aspects of her legal identity. Um, so such was the woman's loss of identity upon her marriage that as put by a prominent uh, commentator uh, of English law, William Blackstone, Quote, a man cannot grant anything to his wife or enter into any covenant with her, for the grant would be to suppose her separate existence, and to covenant with her would really only be to covenant with himself. Now, defenders of the system of coverture would argue that there was no need for a woman to have a legal identity separate from that of her husband, given her interests were, of course, identical um, to his. Now, we know this isn't true. Wives do have certain interests that are different from their husbands. But do animals need a separate legal identity from that of nature? Are the interests of animals ever going to be in opposition to the interests of nature? Now, this is where I will, I will flag that we can only push the concept of kind of coverture um, to the case of rights of nature so far. The analogy isn't perfect. In many cases, what is good for nature is good for animals. Um, and as cases like some of those outlined above show, the rights of nature, um, unlike Victorian era husbands, do have the potential to offer individual animals access to a legal identity of their own. However, in other ways, the analogy I think is very useful. So consider the fact that we've only so far seen rights of nature cases involving charismatic and endangered animals. Presumably the rights of nature would not be applied in the case of quote unquote pest animals or even non-native economically important animals such as cows and chickens. What about rights that do not relate to ecosystem health? So I'm thinking for example of the uh, Naruto, um, the uh, monkey uh, who got embroiled in a copyright case. Um, again, I'm happy to talk about that a little bit more in, in question time if you if you aren't familiar with it. But essentially it was, you know, uh, a case involving a, a monkey who um, his representatives said had a right to copyright. Um, it's not really clear that copyright, copyright has, has much to do with ecosystem health. Um, so therefore it's not really clear that a case like this would have much chance of success under the rights of nature. Um, so yeah, in general, cases that don't touch on ecosystem well-being, are they going to be, um, are animals going to be able to access rights of nature in these cases? So a major concern is that if we rely on the rights of nature as a basis for animal rights, then we risk only seeing them as being members of species that contribute or not to ecosystem health. Um, in this case, we might fail to recognize animals as individuals with interests of their own. 
interests that might sometimes diverge from the rights of nature. Um, and this, I think, depoliticizes the claims of animals. This is because when animals' interests are assumed to be the same as those of nature, we are less able to recognize and therefore to publicly debate whether and how we should respond to those interests as a society. Because um, we're, we're talking about the rights of nature rather than the rights of animals for which we might not have the same kind of vocabulary. So to the extent that animals and um, animal interests that are not seen as contributing to ecosystem or species health remain invisible to the legal, uh, legal system, um, I think that the notion of eco-coverture eco is, is quite a useful tool of analysis. All right, some final thoughts, because I think I've gone a little bit over time. Um, so in this paper, I've suggested that despite the promise shown by the rights of nature movement, it does have important limitations. I don't want to say, I, I, will, I will stress, that the rights of nature, um, you know, should not be pursued at all. Far from it. Um, rights of nature can form a suite of measures that will all hopefully con um, contribute to improving the overall health of animals, um, whether non-human or human. Um, and it, it, it serves as a way uh, of enabling nature to have a, a legal presence um, and, and gives nature protections that it might not otherwise have. However, rights of nature should not be viewed too simplistically as a corrective to the more kind of blatant anthropocentrism of legal personhood. The rights of nature too have their limitations as a grounding for animal rights. As I discussed first, the rights of nature as currently conceived and implemented arguably serve to limit the potential of, of indigenous led movements and knowledge systems to fundamentally reshape our relationships with nature. Um, and this has, I think, pretty important implications for um, the potential for us to improve our relationships with animals. The rights of nature might also reinforce the divide between humans and all other nature. Um, it certainly doesn't really do all that much to challenge it anyway. And finally, as just mentioned, the rights of nature may serve to cover up the individual individuality of animals and therefore fail to provide a platform for those interests of animals that are not necessarily related to ecosystem health. Thank you so much. I leave you uh, with a, a painting that I particularly love, um, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, any questions, comments, and criticisms that you may have. Please feel free um, to send me an email and get in contact. Thank you for your time.